Buried in the second chapter of the book of Revelation, there is a fascinating rebuke by the Lord Jesus of the church located in Thyatira. Something is going on that Jesus is not at all pleased with. Jesus tells them, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jesus refers to a woman he calls Jezebel, indicating his supreme distaste for her behavior. She was passing herself off as a prophetess, a highly spiritual lady who heard directly from God. And then Jesus reveals what's angering him. This Jezebel is encouraging the church members to get involved with sexual immorality. We're not given the exact nature of her teachings, but in some way she was encouraging the local believers to enjoy and engage in unlawful sex. Jesus goes on to say, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. This is interesting, especially in these days when a sizable number of Christians and churches don't at all like the idea of repentance. They're convinced that grace means simply believing without the need of changing one's behavior and turning away from sin. Therefore, in their view, repentance has no place in Christian doctrine. They have a problem, of course, because the word repentance is found throughout the New Testament. So if you press them about that, they will reply that repentance simply means to change your mind and it has nothing to do with behavior. They suggest that Jesus doesn't care about our behavior, never gets upset with anything we may do, and in fact never even sees our sins. But in this little passage about the church in Thyatira, Jesus has surely seen something. He has dealt with the heart of this present-day Jezebel and given her an appropriate time to repent, not merely to change her mind about himself, but about her sexual immorality. Jesus' words leave no wiggle room for the folks who teach that repentance has nothing to do with behavior. This was not a vague, generalized repentance that Jesus was calling for. This was not a matter of deciding to change her attitude over who Jesus was. This was a command to change her mind about her sexual practices and teachings, and consequently to turn away from these things. Now, it is true that the Greek word for repentance literally means to change one's mind, but implied with the changing of the mind is the idea of turning away from a wicked life and going a different direction. Jezebel is told not merely to repent, but to repent of her sexual immorality. Jesus says further, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Jesus is making it plain that he's not at all happy and that he's going to bring judgment and misery upon all who've been influenced by this prophetess of free sex. This hardly sounds like the Jesus we hear preached about in many of the churches these days. The Jesus that we so often hear today is the meek and mild Jesus, the one shown in paintings with a little lamb around his neck. But this Jesus, speaking to the church in Thyatira, is outraged, not just mildly annoyed, but so furious that he's going to rain down all kinds of misery upon those who have followed this prophetic pretender into a carnal lifestyle. And the only way to avoid this terrible judgment from Jesus is to repent of their deeds. In other words, stop doing what you're doing. He takes things even further, saying, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. No talk about how he's going to help them fulfill their destiny. No mention of helping them to achieve greatness, the way many believers today seem to assume is Jesus' primary responsibility. <laughs> Just the terrible words, I will kill her children. Here we have the death knell of the doctrine which says that since we're covered by the grace of Christ, God cannot even see our sins, and that how we behave is totally irrelevant to him. 
We also see the annihilation of the doctrine that repentance has nothing to do with sin and simply means to change our minds about Jesus. I didn't believe in him. Now I believe in him. I've changed my mind. John the Baptist thundered out, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And later, the Apostle Paul, you know, the one who's called the Apostle of Grace, stated, I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Both these men, as different as they were, stated that repentance must be accompanied by works that befit repentance. Now, I believe in grace. I believe in faith. I believe we're saved not by doing good works, but by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. But prospective disciples need to know that accompanying our faith must come a transformed life. Someone much wiser than I once said, Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Real faith, the faith that saves, the faith that makes us children of God, the faith in Jesus Christ that brings forgiveness and eternal life will always be accompanied by repentance, and we can never remain the same.